Welcome back to Harbor Box. Today, we're taking a look at an Intel Celeron processor. And I think this might actually be our first ever review of a Celeron branded processor, at least a dedicated review. Anyway, I've been really keen to explore the rest of the Intel low-end Elder Lake lineup after having been so impressed with the Core i3-12100F. So we're going right to the bottom with the Celeron G6900. I managed to snap one up for 99 Australian dollars. And for my US viewers, there are some listings online for $60, though in-stock listings are more like $75. Either way though, it is a cheap processor. But is it any good and who should buy it? These are the questions I hope to address with this review. But before we jump into the benchmarks, let's quickly go over the specs. And believe me, this won't take too long. The G6900 is a dual core processor. So just two P cores and there's no hyper threading. So right away, that's no doubt gonna raise some red flags with you guys, and rightfully so. I'm actually not sure what a dual core can do these days, even a really powerful one, but I suspect not a lot. Because there is only two cores, the combined L2 cache capacity is just two and a half megabytes, and then we have four megabytes of L3 cache. Compare that with the Core i3-12100F, which actually packs a 12 megabyte L3 cache, and then the Core i5-12400 with 18 megabytes, and you get a sense of just how measly the Celeron is. It's also worth noting that the two cores operate at just 3.4 gigahertz with no turbo boost. Now it does include an integrated graphics engine, which makes sense for this type of product, being that it's largely destined for low budget office use, and of course, I wouldn't expect much out of the UHD 710. It's really only designed for general use, which I suppose is really true for the G6900 in general. This is perhaps the most intriguing thing about the CPU for me. I know it's only really intended for very basic office type use, but what are the limitations? Can it even run a program like Premiere? Of course, we're gonna find out, and along the way, we're also gonna do some for science type testing as well by including the Core i9-12900K, but with just two P cores enabled and all the E cores disabled. And I'll be doing so with and without hyperthreading enabled. This will allow us to compare the Intel Elder Lake architecture with just two P cores enabled. But in the case of the 12900K, the cores are clocked 47% higher with seven and a half times more L3 cache. So we're basically creating the ultimate dual core processor. And I still wonder, Will that be enough processing power for any of today's games? Now for testing the Celeron G6900, I'm using the MSI B660M Morta Wi-Fi DDR4 with 32 gigabytes of dual rank, dual channel DDR4 3200CL14 memory. The same stuff I use for all of our DDR4 testing. The KSQ Outer Lake CPUs have been tested on the MSI Z690 Tomahawk Wi-Fi DDR4 using the same memory, and all boards were updated to the latest BIOS revision. I've also updated all of my Ryzen data using the MSI X570S Tomahawk Wi-Fi motherboard. All gaming data has been updated for the AM4 and LJ1700 CPUs with resizable bar enabled. And the final test system note worth mentioning is the fact that all application and gaming data has been collected using an AMD Radeon RX 6900 XT graphics card, and the operating system of choice was Windows 11. Okay, I think that covers it. Let's dive into the results. Starting with the Cinebench R23 multi-core benchmark, we find that the G6900 is firmly at the bottom of our graph. With just two cores, it produced a score of 1,934 points, and that meant the Core i3-10100F was 176% faster. So quite a massive difference here. And given you can buy the Core i3 processor for $85 right now, it makes the G6900 extremely difficult to justify for just $10 less. So that's probably not a great start. As for the four science testing, we see that the 12900K with just two P cores and two threads was 74% faster than the G6900, which is impressive given it is only clocked 47% higher. So that extra L3 cache is making up for a good portion of that gain. Then with hyperthreading enabled, the two P core 12900K configuration matched the Core i3-10100F, which again is very impressive. Sure, the 12900K has a lot more L3 cache, but the fact that Elder Lake with just two P cores and four threads can match a 10th gen part with four cores and eight threads is mighty impressive. The G6900 fares a lot better for the single core test, basically matching the Core i3-10100F, which is quite impressive given the 10100F is clocked 6% higher with 50% more L3 cache. Then we see that the 12900K with the same core configuration as that of the G6900 
is 62% faster thanks to a boost in core clock speed as well as a larger L3 cache capacity. Moving on, we have the 7-zip file manager compression test. And again, we're looking at just under half the performance of the 10100F, which costs just $10 more. So it's hard to make a case for the G6900 based on these results. And the situation worsens when looking at decompression performance, which leverages simultaneous multi-threading technology really well. And of course, the G6900 doesn't support SMT. And here the 10100F is a little over three times faster. The 12900K dual core configuration without SMT was 56% faster, and then an additional 48% faster with SMT enabled. The Celeron G6900 is painfully slow for rendering tasks, and frankly, you just never use it for this kind of workload, especially given that the 10100F was three times faster, and it's considered to be a slow processor by today's standards for this sort of workload. Ideally, the G6900 needs to be clocked higher, and of course, a larger L3 cache capacity wouldn't hurt, as the 12900K, when running the same core configuration, was roughly 40% faster. The G6900 was somewhat usable, I suppose, in Premiere Pro 2021. You could certainly edit a video with this CPU, but the encode times and applying certain effects would be painfully slow. Here you're looking at roughly twice the performance from a Core i3 10100F. Photoshop is more of a lightly threaded application, so here the G6900 does fare a bit better. But even so, it was well down on the 10100F score and miles slower than older parts like the Ryzen 5 3600. That said, the dual core 12900K configuration boosted performance here by a massive 52%. Adobe After Effects is a blend of single and multi threaded loads, so the G6900 doesn't fare quite as well here as the 10100F was 70% faster. I'd say clock speed is the biggest issue here, next to the lack of cores, of course, as the dual core 12900K configuration was 49% faster and enabling hyper-threading boosted performance by a further 25%. Once again, I'm going to include Factorio in the application benchmarks as we're not measuring FPS here, but rather updates per second. This automated benchmark calculates the time it takes to run 1000 updates, and this is a single threaded test which apparently relies heavily on cache performance. Being that this is a single threaded test, the G6900 does fare pretty well compared to the Ryzen 5 3600, Ryzen 7 3700X, and Core i3 10100F. That said, the smaller L3 cache capacity does hurt here, as the 12100F was 32% faster, and the 12400, 41% faster. The dual core 12900K configurations do much better thanks to the larger 30 megabyte L3 cache, and interestingly, disabling hyperthreading does boost performance quite significantly. We're looking at a 16% performance improvement without hyperthreading. Now, I'm not sure how many people will be keen to carry out code compilation work with the Celeron G6900, but if you are, I recommend you reconsider because once again, basically for the same money, the 10100F is almost three times faster. Still, it was impressive to find that the 12900K with just two cores and four threads was able to roughly match the 10100F. The last application benchmark is Blender, and this is a particularly terrible result for the G6900 as the 10100F was three and a half times faster. We also see that the dual core 12900K was almost 70% faster, while hyper-threading boosted performance by a further 56%. Disappointingly, in our test system, the G6900 consumed slightly more power than the Core i3-10100F, despite being significantly slower. So in terms of power efficiency, it's not particularly impressive. In fact, the 12900K clocked 47% higher, only consumed a few extra watts, which was quite unexpected. Okay, time for some gaming. Well, maybe not gaming exactly, more like horrific frame stuttering. The G6900 looks okay in F1 2021 if we focus on the 89 FPS average, but taking one look at the actual gameplay, it was quite evident there was an issue with constant stuttering resulting in 1% lows of just 7 FPS. The dual core 12900K configuration wasn't really any better when it came to actual playability. However, with hyperthreading enabled, the 1% lows picked up dramatically, and now the game was very playable with barely any frame pacing issues. Of course, it was still much slower than, say, the Ryzen 5 3600, but performance could now at least pass as playable. Rainbow Six Siege suffered similar issues with the G6900. Again, the average frame rate looked great, but it was the 1% lows that were terrible, making the game a stuttery mess and completely unplayable. 
Even with two really fast cores, the game was still unplayable with 1% lows of just 21 FPS. That said, we did find, with hyperthreading enabled, that the dual core 12900K was once again able to deliver playable performance, and although frame consistency wasn't as good as it could have been, performance overall was solid and certainly very playable. Watch Dogs Legion was also horrible with the G6900 with performance that was miles away from resembling anything playable. The dual core 12900K was significantly better, but still pretty rough, while the HT enabled configuration was playable, though still very much suboptimal when compared to budget parts like the 10100F. Even older games like Shadow of the Tomb Raider aren't playable with the Celeron G6900, not even remotely close. As it stands, there is no dual core processor or dual core configuration on the planet that can enable playable performance in this game at least without SMT support. The two core 4 thread 12900K configuration was playable and performance overall was surprisingly good, despite being well down on what we saw with the 10100F. The Rift Breaker actually crashed several times when trying to test with the G6900 and stability aside performance was nowhere near playable. The dual core 12900K was a lot better, but it really required hyperthreading support to deliver perfectly playable performance though that's still an impressive achievement for a dual core configuration. Hitman 3 was nothing more than stuttery frames with the G6900. There wasn't a moment that revealed normal looking gameplay. The two core two thread 12900K configuration was no better, but with hyperthreading enabled, it was a completely different result. And now the game was very playable. Frame rate consistency wasn't great and stuttering was very noticeable at times, but overall the game was playable. Age of Empires 4 is only a very lightly threaded game, so the G6900 does manage to survive here. The experience wasn't exactly stutter free, but overall it was playable, and this is the first example we have where the Celeron processor does actually work. Far Cry 6, despite being another lightly threaded game, the G6900 just didn't even come close to working. The dual core 12900K was unusable as well here, though again we do find another instance where enabling hyperthreading saved performance. Sure the 1% lows are still very weak, but the two core 4 thread 12900K configuration was actually usable. With Horizon Zero Dawn we could load into the menu quite easily actually, with just two cores and two threads, but that was as far as we were getting with this configuration. The built-in benchmark, along with the game itself, just failed to load. Even after 30 minutes, I was still stuck at the loading screen. Enabling hyperthreading did solve that issue, and now the two-core four-thread 12900K configuration enabled quite strong performance that was similar to that of the Ryzen 5 3600 and Core i3-10100F. Last up, we have Cyberpunk 2077, and this is also broken with just two cores. And like Horizon Zero Dawn, you can't load any games. Enabling hyperthreading on the dual core 12900K did once again solve that issue, and the game was now playable. Of course, frame pacing certainly wasn't amazing, but the game was playable and not really as bad as I was expecting. There's not much point looking at the 10 game average given that the Celeron G6900 failed to post a result in some of the games, while performance in most was completely unplayable. Needless to say, unless you're playing five-year-old games, in some instances even older games, the G6900 just isn't going to cut it. As far as gaming CPUs go though, the Celeron G6900 just makes absolutely no sense because as I noted at the start of the video, the Core i3-10100F costs just $10 more. Moreover, the Core i3-12100F, that should be priced at around $110 to $120 US, though that part does appear to be having some supply issues right now. Frankly, the Celeron G6900 really doesn't make sense at any price. For gamers, it would be a tough sell at even, say, $20, because, you know, it just can't play games, especially any relatively modern AAA title. Also, at $20 US, you'd be looking at around $105 US to pair it with the cheapest H610 board, whereas for $50 more, you could land the Core i3-10100F plus an H510 combo, which is around three times faster and allows for playable performance in all modern games. The fact is the G6900 is just too slow to make sense. The L3 cache is too small, the clock speeds are too low, and more crucially, the lack of hyperthreading means that many new games don't even work. Basically, the G6900 is too low end to the point where it just doesn't seem to make any sense for anyone. If you're a budget gamer, you'd just get the Core i3-10100, which is about the same price when factoring in the board costs. 
And if you want to go cheaper, then you'd be best off trying your luck on the secondhand market. Ideally, the Core i3 12100F is as low as gamers will want to go today, with the Core i5 12400F being our recommended sweet spot for budget gaming. Gaming aside though, we still don't see who the G6900 makes sense for. Again, for roughly the same money, you just get the much more powerful Core i3 10100F. Intel also has the Pentium G7400, which should arrive next month, and it will come with slightly higher clock speeds and 50% more L3 cache capacity, and it also gets hyper-threading support. So quite a substantial upgrade over the G6900. It still won't be nearly as fast as the two-core four-thread 12900K configuration shown in this video, which means the Core i3-10100F will still be a better buy, with the 12100F being a far better choice. That means the Core i3-12100F is without question the cheapest Elder Lake CPU you should really bother with. So that's it really. The Celeron G6900 was a failed experiment for us. This dual core simply isn't powerful enough for gaming. And while it did work well enough for general usage, there are much better alternatives for basically the same amount of money. So if you enjoyed this video, give it one of those. You can subscribe for more content. Probably done with most of the Elder Lake CPU testing for the moment. There is a Pentium part, but not sure that's gonna be worth looking at. I think it's gonna be a similar story to this as I mentioned. So yeah, but there'll be plenty of other content worth subscribing for. Also, if you'd like to support the Hardware Unbox channel, we have Patreon and Floatplane. Links for those are in the video description. You'll get access to our Discord server, really cool community over there. Monthly live streams to myself, that'll be coming up next week for Patreon and Floatplane members. Behind the scenes content, Q and A's. So a lot of cool stuff there. If you're interested, check it out, but if not, perfectly fine. And I would like to thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve. I'll see you again next time.